Hey guys, this is Thoe Bishop with Radio Rothbard, and we've got a great offer only for Radio Rothbard listeners. We've been talking a lot of late about Murray Rothbard's Betrayal of the American Right. And if you want to get your own copy, uh, for one, you should already have one, but if you don't yet, that's okay. Uh, we have a 20% off coupon code at the Mises store. Just hit uh, code ROTHPOD, R-O-T-H-P-O-D, and we, you'll get 20% off a new copy of Betrayal of the American Right, one of my favorite books of Rothbard, one that I think you'll definitely enjoy, particularly if you're a fan of this show. Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. Though Bishop here, joined as always by Ryan McMakin. And we have a special guest for today's episode, Brandon Buck, uh, who I was very happy to meet at this year's RGS. Uh, Brandon is getting his PhD at George Mason in history, but uh, his focus is on a topic that is unfortunately relevant uh, to today's world kind of the history of the anti war right. Um, before we begin, Ryan, uh, last week's episode, we got a lot of great feedback. Um, you know, how, how, did you get any particular interesting emails from, from last week's show on uh, the right against the regime? Well, I did get an email from Joshua Tate, who wrote that article we had talked about a lot at The Bulwark. And he was very polite. Um, I thought we had trashed the article <laughs> too much to, to earn any politeness. But, I mean, he, he was right. Uh, we actually had said, right? I, I said, I basically agree with this article. Um, Except that for the framing, right? Because he was talking about how uh, the uh, the issue is is that suddenly the right is waking up to this idea that they actually oppose what the government is doing and not just the welfare state aspect of it. Um, and then, so the real area of disagreement was: is that a good thing or a bad thing, or is it a dangerous thing? I, you know, I of course think it's a good thing um, because as as we'll talk about. Uh, today, uh, the the right has just so law for so long played real nice with the regime and its wars and its socialism and stuff. Yeah, we criticize uh, Medicaid every now and then, but but basically everything else the regime does is fine. Social Security, they never actually criticize that, and then of course openly support wars, and it's been this way since. Uh, 1945 at least. But but our guest, I think, will probably provide a lot more detail there on that. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today specifically on uh, the domestic views on foreign policy. And I, that's a great lead in. So, so Brandon, uh, one of the things I love about your research project is that I, I'm sure, you know, particularly if you're listening to this podcast, uh, at least you have passing familiarity with sort of Rothbard's narrative of the betrayal of the American right, how the neoconservatives were able to kind of take over that you know, the, the right side of American politics and the Republican Party and the, the, the dire consequences that, that it had for the second half of the 20th century and the days we live in now. Um, but, but your research builds on that narrative with a lot of very empirical work. And I know you've, you've spent a lot of research coming through uh, congressional voting records and, and all that sort of fun stuff. So for our audience, can you just uh, explain a little bit about your research project and uh, kind of the work that you've been doing uh, going through with your PhD? Yes. Yeah, so my research started with that Rothbard sort of 54, 55 sort of window. Uh, it, you know, that is the sort of agreed upon scholarly consensus by people who study both the early national security state and uh, American politics. And of course, it's also, it's, it's also held on to by folks like Rothbard, Justin Romando, Bill Kaufman, and other folks who are who are certainly closer to, to these uh, events described. Uh, so I came with this project with a question because I also knew about Rothbard, the Paleo Strategy, uh, Buchanan in '92. So I was curious where did um, right wing non uh, interventionism go in that after that sort of '54 '55 window, and so. You know, very quickly, I discovered that it, you know, it it didn't really go anywhere. It it survives in a kind of attenuated form, a sort of fortress America vision for the Cold War world. And while you know Rothbard and Co. were certainly right that a lot of changes happened in that sort of 54, 55 window. Taft dies in fifty three. Uh, National National Review begins up in in, the, in that time frame as well. A lot of folks um, pass away. Uh, Garrett Garrett being being one of them. 
If you turn your gaze towards Congress and towards other forms of conservative media, you find that much of the non-interventionism of the interwar period survives despite the necessities of the uh, Cold War world. So, Very interesting. And, and uh, uh, can you talk about you know, some of these kind of congressional figures? Because I, I know with, with kind of the way that history is written, right, we, we focus on presidents, right? We, we focus on the victors of sort of the national inner party debates, but obviously, you know, particularly in the 20th century, the, the regional conflicts are very fascinating from a variety of perspectives, right? You can think about uh, various Southern populists within the Democratic Party that obviously do not fit kind of your standard narrative of the, the left becoming, uh, you know, the, the more liberal, uh, you know, uh, uh, culturally left sort of style of things. But I, I know you, you highlight um, within your work some of the the right wing politicians, particularly I think with the Midwest, right, that with their votes, right, with, with their actions within Congress, you know, they, they were on the losing side of this gradual ramp up of, you know, t- second half of the 20th century kind of American imperialism abroad. Um, can you talk a little bit about you know some of the the interesting congressional figures that were kind of keeping this fight alive, at least within the halls of Congress? Yes. Yeah, so the the Midwestern, so the rural Midwest of the Republican Party hangs on to much of its non-interventionism coming out of the interwar period. So uh, in the interwar period leading up to World War II, uh, the sort of headquarters of American non-interventionism was in the Midwest due to a variety of historical you know, factors we can we can get into if you like. Uh, but these folks remain largely unchanged um, after the end of World War II. Whereas the Northern Republicans of a more liberal and moderate stripe who go into the, who, who during the interwar period were more sympathetic to um, non-interventionism, they're, they're really changed by the events of the war. Um, however, these holdouts in, in, the, in the Midwest are not. Um, they do sort of bend a little bit on um, protections uh, for, for Taiwan, you know, once again, <laughs> back at, in importance in the news. But on other aspects, and particularly on the issue of foreign aid, they remain every bit as intransigent as they were during early periods, even even more so. Uh, there was a little bit of compromise in the immediate after in the immediate a- after of World War II via like the, the Marshall Plan. It was sold as a temporary measure. How often have we heard that before? Uh, but it becomes institutionalized as as the Cold War goes on, and so these holdouts in the Midwest maintain the resistance and and try to sort of, you know, to, uh, to sabotage these plans in Washington. And the other aspect were some elements of multilateralism and, um, and uh, um, aspects of uh, defense pacts and the like. So, you know, as late as like 1965, the Republican right wanted to pull U.S. troops out of Europe, with the exception of West Berlin, nearly as like a kind of tripwire uh, for the Soviets. And they wanted to do the same for East Asia, despite having a certain soft spot um, for, you know, certain governments in the Pacific. And th- throughout all this, you know, they maintained a sort of dissident view of the Second World War. And I think this is really the sort of lifeblood of their dissident view in the Cold War. You know, they did not view the Second World War as this purely righteous, um, you know, accident that was forced upon forced upon the United States with the events of Pearl Harbor, but rather it was it was the inevitable um, outcome of American involvement in the Philippines and in Europe during sort of World War I. Well, you know, I remember uh, in the, well, I wasn't, I wasn't there, uh, but in the late 70s, uh, in the wake of, of Vietnam, um, and of course, what you got is you have uh, Lyndon Johnson basically really starting that war, sustaining it, making the buildup happen. Um, and you had, and then of course, Truman with Korea, right? So I remember in the late 70s, it became kind of a talking point among some Republicans to refer to those quote unquote Democrat wars. Uh, and, and so it's trying to position the GOP a little bit as the anti-war party, recognizing, of course, that these wars were very unpopular. Uh, but of course that was all pre-Reagan, um, when it became gospel to, uh, to revive, uh, 
the um, the public relations value of the military and, and to really play up the value of military intervention. And Granada, I suppose, was perhaps hailed as a big success. And the next thing you know, then in the late late 80s, you got Panama. And the, so I think that slow buildup then to Iraq, uh, the first Iraq war. And then and then I guess in typical Dem fashion, Clinton just normalizes all of that, as well as the the multilateral aspect of it. And then you get 9-11. And Tho and I were talking about this, I think offline last time on how the whole the the anti-interventionist thing never really quite went away uh, on the right. And it wasn't really do too much to theoretical weakness. They had some good arguments and they certainly had people who were sympathetic to the point of view on the right. But 9-11 just was really just devastating to the argument in a similar way that Pearl Harbor was devastating to the America First Committee. And that just convincing people under those conditions that uh, because people just don't understand diplomacy, they don't understand that uh, defensive military is different from just invading a bunch of countries and that those things don't necessarily make you safer. It's real hard to explain those things. So it's just much easier to say, hey, these people attacked us, so let's start a new war. And so there's just those two events were always devastating to the idea of non-intervention. And it never killed the idea intellectually or theoretically, but you have to then get people beyond those sorts of historical events to start taking seriously the idea of non-intervention again, it seems. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the late '70s, and uh, and so in '73, the the sort of what you might think of as like the last of the old right retires. A man named H.R. Gross. You can kind of think of him as a sort of proto Ron Paul in a way, and he quite tragically voted for the Gulf of Tonkin resolution despite being very vocally against the war in Vietnam. But he said, but he hung around into the early '70s and opposed rather vehemently. The expansion of the war into Laos and Cambodia. And I was just going through his, his papers a few weeks ago and reading these constituent letters, people like begging him to do what you can to like get out of this. Like we, we were told this war was going to be ramping down. And he says that he's trying, but there's this kind of sense of futility because, you know, what vestiges there were uh, on, on these kind of issues from the late 50s and early 60s had through attrition, either they just died in office or there was also, as I'm sort of arguing in my dissertation, um, the FCC and the IRS were being leveraged against some of these so-called ultra-right um, broadcasters who held on to some of these dissident views of, of, of Vietnam. So that, so you know, one of the one of the quandaries I'm trying to to work, you know get my arms around is how is it that uh, the old right's view of America and the world begins to sunset at precisely the same time one would think it would have its most sort of fertile ground. Uh, and, you know, not just internationally, but also domestically, right? Like all of the revelations of what, what all the shenanigans the CIA and, and the FBI were up to throughout the 60s. But this seedbed has been basically sort of cleared out, first by the sort of Eisenhower wing of the Republican Party at the top, and then through, you know, uh, folks like, you know, uh, William F. Buckley, you know, policing people on his right. So by the time you get to the 70s, you know, what, what vestiges of this ideology there were have basically been shunted into the libertarian movement and, you know, perhaps like uh, like the Rockford Institute, you know, in Illinois. But like what 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 small um, threads of institutional power, which had hung on at the end of uh, 45, are basically cut uh, by the by the mid 70s. And that's how you get, you know, Reaganism and you know, neoconservatism and the like. This is one of those very interesting and, and kind of troubling parallels that we see right now. I, I know you've written about um, the way, as you mentioned, the FCC and some of these other government institutions. You know, if, if you think back at Pearl Harbor, right? You know, that, that's an attack on, you know, American soil. You think about 9 11, it's an attack on American soil. You know, if some guy comes up to a bar and punches you in the face, you're immediate, you know, you, it's, it's the emotional response is to fight back. It doesn't matter if, you know, some other guy that told him that, you know, you, you were hitting on his girl, right? So that he felt that he was justified in doing so, right? There's that, there's that natural reaction there to kind of fight back. But it seems that the amount of effort the regime requires to get normal Americans to have that sort of emotional buy-in into conflicts that did not immediate, you know, that did not start with kind of shedding of American blood on American soil, 
Uh, that requires an, an incredible amount of propaganda power. And, and, and you talked about uh, in, in one of the articles you've, you've written about kind of the, the, the way that the, the threat, living threat of fascism, right, was kind of used as a way of, of, of demonizing these sort of, of non-interventionist, you know, right-wingers, which again seems extremely relevant when you have Joe Biden out there actively t- you're bragging, you're taunting, uh, I think yesterday was, you know, the, the, these heroic right-wing Americans that want to, you know, that want to stand up against, you know, the American government. Well, haha, you know, you're, you're going to need F-15s. Again, funny to do that shortly after the anniversary of pulling out of Afghanistan or, or you know, his, his the, the explicit line of the Democratic Party that the re- current Republican Party is, is essentially a neo-fascist movement um, trying to destroy American democracy, which, you know, of course, is meant to embody everything good in the world. Um, can you talk a little bit about that dynamic and, and maybe some parallels that you see between what's happening in the 60s and, and that era and, and the kind of the modern political environment we find ourselves in? You know, I certainly think we're living through a third brown scare. I think the first the first brown scare would be, you know, the, the interwar period, as as you say, this fear of domestic fascism. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, there was an American boon, there were silver shirts, there were some people of the, you know, you might call it like the far right or the illiberal right, but they were so, they were so far few in number. They had no real political power. Um, the Nazis were horrible at domestic espionage in, in the United States. What few agents they had got captured, but nevertheless, these, these fail, these, these, these small groups and their rather tenuous connection to more mainstream f- figures or bodies like the America First Committee was used to gin up this fear of domestic fascism, um, and this did attenuate, you know, the 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 uh, the argument about intervention and then about America in in, in the post-war period. You know, we, we think of the anti-war, um, the interwar period as hosting essentially just like anti-war right, but there were anti-war progressives, there were liberals who were opposed to intervention, but partially through this, this sort of brown scare, those people are sort of scared away or severed off um, from the forces on the right. Uh, and this had a bit of a, this was sort of tamped down in, in the uh, in the post-war period. Uh, I'm, I recently came into some, some great sources where I figured named Robert E. Wood, who was a, a, ch- a chief figure amongst the America First Committee, uh, was writing to a senator named uh, Carl Muntz, asking him to turn the Dias Committee, which originally was used to hunt the far right, to do it for a tool to go after domestic communists and the people who smeared him during the interwar period. So you can see like the second red scare really is being a form of payback for the, for the Brown scare. I think this is something that Rothbard mentions in betrayal of, of the American right quite openly is that he, he wanted revenge for being accused of being, you know, um, a fascist in the, in the thirties. And then if this boomerangs back, you can, you can argue that there was a second Brown scare, which is really this what we call the uh, the ultra right fear in, in the 1960s. Well, once again, the fear of domestic fascism was used to curtail, uh, you know, the um, the Overton window. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Barry Goldwater was it was accused of being a fascist. You know, I think we all sort of know that story, and we're sitting through it again. And I think unlike the earlier periods, so. You know, one of the things I've been writing about is, you know, conspiracism and conspiratorial thinking and arguing that, you know, the, the, the mode that we're living in where people don't trust the institutions is well, well grounded in reality, like empirically. Uh, you know, a big part of the, of the Brown Scare and the interwar period were people on the right and you know, others more generally understanding that they were they were basically deceived into entering World War One, like the Brit- like British intelligence was trying to gin up uh, American opinion to support I- intervention. They they had suspicions that the same thing was happening and they didn't know it at the time, but it was. I mean, the British intelligence again was trying to, to gin up American support for entry into the war. I mean, for perfectly understandable reasons, right? They, they wanted to survive as a nation, uh, but they went so, so far as to interfere in American elections. Uh, it actually got a very prominent um, non-interventionist unseated, a man named man name of uh, Hamilton Fish III. So revelations of this came out in the early 60s, right as the SEC and the IRS were launching their, their war against the first generation of, of conservative talk radio. So conservatives who were alive in the 30s, now active in the 60s, they're, they're coming to find out that, oh, wait a minute, we were right. Like, there, there really was a conspiracy against us. 
And so you fast forward 30 years later, the revelations of the FCC and the IRS come out in the 90s. And so now you, so now you have two, really three generations of sort of malfeasance on the part of the American establishment feeding into this notion that, yes, the, the, like the institutions are, in fact, corrupt and and arrayed against us. So I think part of this sort of fear of of fascism now is the fact that only only, only half the country seems to be recognized this history, the fact that, you know, the government has used its 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 institutions and its agencies to to pin in uh, the Overton window, particularly on on, on the issues of, uh, of foreign policy. Well, and people I think recognize they're being lied to a lot of the time um, as an important component of the failure of institutions. <clears throat> and that was a point Lou Rockwell often made: is like, look, the regime lies to you all the time, but they especially lie to you on foreign policy. Uh, you really can't believe what they're telling you there. And that was often the blind spot that you would get on the right is, oh, you know, I, you can't trust the government. I don't believe anything they say. What's that? What's that? The, the, the federal government told me that Iran is planning to invade America and destroy everyone in America. Well, I believe that 100 percent do whatever it takes to invade and destroy Iran because the federal government told me. And so it was just kind of this weird um, sort of uh, self-defeating uh, view of the regime that the right was taking. But I, I think it uh, it's taking more and more to get people worked up. I mean, even in World War II, Paul Fussell in his book Wartime uh, notes that even in Europe, they really didn't know why they were there. And because everyone agreed that you have to fight Japan because Japan bombed us and uh, let's let's obliterate the Japanese. But Fussell, who served in... Uh, in Europe, said that the, ad, the kind of the thinking among the, the common soldiers in in Europe was like, I'm, I'm not ex I'm not quite sure why we're fighting Germany. And he said when we would ask the higher ups, it was just some really generic stuff about like fighting global fascism and how Nazis didn't like America and they were fascists and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna liberate Europe and and all that stuff. It, it had nothing to, to do directly with defending the United States, as, as you could easily tell people who were fighting in the Pacific. Hey, look, the Japanese, they want to invade America. And so even then, it required a bit of effort to get the Americans to buy into the war in Europe side of things. And you probably had continued then issues with that, like Korea, Vietnam, you had to manufacture the whole domino theory thing. And it was quite delightful then to see finally when they tried to get the U.S. to the Americans to support the invasion of Syria, how nobody seemed particularly enthusiastic about it. Nobody seemed to care. So they ended up, you know, putting a few small units in Syria and doing sort of a stealth invasion there. But I think the hope was among uh, the neoconservative crowd was that, well, well, this is the new Iran or Iraq, and we'll we'll get everybody buying into this idea that we need troop boots on the ground in Syria, and the support just never came. So it was at that point that I was wondering, maybe people are starting to kind of learn their lesson on this, that uh, maybe it's getting harder and harder to convince people that the, this latest war is a good idea. And I think maybe some progress has actually been made in that respect. But I think as some of the point that Brandon is making is that it was never actually totally easy. There was there was always some effort that had to be made. And I think maybe when you when you look back on it, you just see the winning side of it and you just think, well, yeah, everybody agreed that this was a great idea. But I think it is important to highlight that there is usually a sizable amount of dissent in a lot of these cases. Uh, but then the Washington elites just, just end up taking a position. And we've known, of course, for decades that elites don't have the same foreign policy positions as most of the taxpayers. There's usually a big gulf there in opinion. And, and that, that persists back into the forties and fifties, even there were some actual disagreements. That, so I think it's important to keep in mind that, uh, this is not a new thing, right? The idea that there's some dissent here as far as foreign policy goes. And of course the elites also don't have nearly as much skin in the game. I, I know I, one of the articles that you wrote, Brandon, you, you kind of highlight the, the, the difference in casualties for you know Americans in kind of rural America versus the, the you know the size of the population within kind of elite cities, right? You know, what one of the reasons that so much kind of state capacity is needed to kind of really fund that war machine is because that war machine churns out the bodies of Americans that are not those generally connected to to those in power. Can you talk a little bit about that that dynamic of your research? Yeah. So. Um... <laughs> 
you know, American foreign policy is fundamentally liberal. Uh, and I mean that, and I, I use that word advisedly. I don't mean leftist. I mean, I mean like a kind of center left liberal technocratic um, sort of view of the world. So it's always been kind of a, like a weird graft onto American conservative thinking. I mean, conservatism in America is basically sort of right liberalism. So I think in some way, one of the reasons why this is coming apart now is because since the 70s, with the elimination of the draft uh, and the implementation of selective service, we've, you know, the U.S. government has basically created a martial caste uh, where you have, you know, smaller and smaller segments of American society, more and more generational service, particularly in the American South uh, and also in the interior, uh, you know, serving in the United States military. And so, you know, as I've argued in some of, some of my work is that, you know, over the past 20 years, uh, you know, the, the burden of service ha has been pushed more and more into the exurbs and, and, uh, and the rural areas of the United States, all across the United States. I mean, you know, you know one of the interesting things about this movement is it, it, it is sort of decentralized, whereas before the, the non-interventionist right was mostly Midwestern, not entirely, but, but mostly. Now it's spread out through, you know, parts of the Rust Belt, parts of the South, the Middle West, you know, and the uh, Rocky Mountain West. And, you know, part of what I argue is that uh, this disparity in service has exacerbated other aspects of our cultural war and our domestic, uh, you know, uh, political squabbles, right? You know, regardless of how you feel about it, immigration, it doesn't make sense to argue that you can't afford to build a border wall or increase, you know, you know, policing of the border while also spending a bajillion dollars to police other, you know, countries' borders. Similarly, I think this has exacerbated this, uh, you know, this sort of great sort, as it's been called, this creation of, uh, of a sort of upper middle class versus sort of everybody else, that most folks who live in high income, you know, uh, zip codes don't join, don't, don't join the military. They certainly don't, don't enlist. Um, so I think this, this disparity is being, is being, is being widened because there is this sort of view of middle America and rural America as being like part of the provinces, right? Like we're seeing this emergence of a, of imperial thinking within the United States, which is fascinating because in the old days, people in the Midwest viewed themselves as being in a colonial relationship with the East. And I think you're starting to see that reemerge again, but this way, this time it's, it's, <laughs> it's a two way street where people are openly, openly talking about, um, populism as being like a kind of rebellion um, in America against the sort of um, metropole. Brian, if, if I can ask a personal question, um, you yourself served in the military. Uh, uh, can you talk, did, did you feel, again, I mean, obviously this is before diving into, you know, this is this sort of deep research project, but, but did you feel that sort of class difference serving, you know, versus say the, the politicians on TV or, or perhaps certain types of, of military leaders um, that, that do not go the enlisted route. Did, did you feel that kind of on the ground or, or did, did your colleagues and, and, and you know, brothers in arms, did they, they, did they ever kind of comment on that sort of class distinction there that, that you're kind of talking about? Oh, yeah. I mean, so uh, I, I joined before 9-11. I come from a, fir a firmly upper middle class background. I basically enlisted as, a, as, as an act of like rebellion against my like, you know, <laughs> elite bourgeois background. And yeah, I'm, and, you know, in the sort of platoons that I, I served in, I was basically only one or two of a person of my socioeconomic status. Most people were, you know, working class white people from the rural, rural areas or working class you know, black folks or Hispanics from the inner cities. And there was this sort of class tension or like, you know, gentle chiding about, you know, having a silver spoon or, or so they thought anyways. So, yeah, I mean, without my military time, I probably never would have been exposed that regularly to, to working class people. It just wouldn't have happened. Um, I also served, served in the national guard, which is a little bit different because it's a kind of a different, um, a different socioeconomic strata, but even there, it, it's basically skewed towards, you know, towards working class people, you know, gray collar jobs, as you might, as you might say. Um, and this, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting because this is something that I think people, you know, of, you know, I'm working on a PhD, I'm most certainly not a blue collar guy, but this is one of these aspects of the kind of class divide, which seems to be completely lost on people um, in my educational cohort, that this, that this exists. And unless it's addressed, it could, it could lead to some serious problems in this country. 
Well, one of the interesting things going on right now is that it seems that the regime is kind of actively provoking precisely the types of people that historically serve in the military. I mean, you, you kind of saw a, a de facto purge of sorts with the use of vaccine mandates, um, where you had a lot of people you know, fall out of military service because of that. A lot of people felt they had, had no other option and, and at the very least harbor an element of resentment to that. And I remember vividly, you know, I, I thought one of the most telling sort of portraits of modern American politics was the Biden administration, you know, where they, they bring in all these National Guard members to you know fortify the inauguration after January 6th. And yet they didn't trust the military members with ammo. <laughs> Right. So I, I mean, I can't imagine a more or more fitting illustration of the modern regime than a militarized presidential inauguration full of service members that they don't trust to actually fire. Um, again, kind of goes to the, the legitimacy of, of the, the standing power arrangements. And I know, Ryan, you've talked a little bit about, you know, you know the, 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 the falling uh, enlistment rates. As perhaps you know, one of the silver, one of the, one of the the, the the positive indications of growing distrust of the regime. I have a feeling that the you know it, it takes a whole lot of of uh, college education and a lot of time in D.C. to think that you're going to replace you know Georgia for, Georgia farm boys with a bunch of uh, trans women of color uh, to make up the backbone of the American military. Um, but you know that seems to be though where we are <laughs> in, in America, 2022. Well. Did you see, speaking of that, maybe the plan uh, to uh, to ensure that uh, you still have Georgia farm boys uh, applying to the military is to is to tank the economy? Did you? <laughs> yes, yes. This yes. is an interesting conspiracy theory, and I don't use that as a pejorative. Maybe, maybe there's some elements of this. Did you see that tweet? It was some GOP congressman. Yeah, Jim Banks. Saying that now there are good arguments against loan forgiveness. That the that Biden is doing lots of good arguments against it, but this GOP congressman gets up there and says loan forgiveness is bad because now we won't have like working class people over a barrel uh, paying off student loans, and now they won't feel they won't have to join the military to get the GI Bill. Now people can just pay off their college costs without having to go through the military first. And he thought this was just a brilliant patriotic argument. He's like, basically, he was saying, we aren't screwing poor people enough and forcing them into the military. This is a GOP thing. So, I mean, just astounding that that he said that part out loud. And I guess, obviously, he had this thought, right? I guarantee you, he said this to someone else, like, over lunch already. And they all laughed and thought that was a brilliant observation. And then he says it on Twitter, just, like, truly bizarre. And when for context, he's like Jim Banks, he's the head of the Republican Study Committee, which is kind of supposed to be uh, the, the, the more conservative, uh, serious wing of the Republican Party. Um, it was kind of the precursor to the Freedom Caucus before uh, the, the Boehner Ryan types kind of took it over. I think it was like 2014 or so. But like Banks was someone who he, he, he talks a lot about, you know, sort of working class blue collar values. And, and, and yet, so, 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 so this is not like, uh, you know, this isn't like Kevin McCarthy or some sort of like obvious dopey person out there. Uh, like, like th this is someone who, who in theory is is one of the better than average Republicans who has this thought, which again just goes to just how how insane uh, the, the the quality of your average Republican congressman in D.C. really is, even in 2022. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I. You know, in, in some sense, I think the right is coming around on this notion of interventionism, but it's not necessarily coming around on this notion of militarism. Because, uh, you know, once upon a time, to be a traditionalist conservative was to sort of view military service with some suspicion, especially for the draft, right? I mean, there's this notion that the, the war and the draft upsets traditional families, it upsets your local communities, it pulls people out of their desired professions. But in that 48 to 55 window, it's when, you know, the right starts to sort of acquiesce to most aspects of defense spending. And that has been something that has been, you know, stuck. Uh, I suspect part of that might be, you know, material, uh, especially in the, in the Sun Belt as the center of, of uh, as the political center of the American right shifts south and into the west. You're, you're not in economies that are more firmly in line with with the needs of the of the defense department 
And you also just, at this point, you have like three or four generations of inertia built up in, with this reverence for, for military service. So uh, that's going to be a difficult thing, I think, to, well, maybe not. I, that pro- That's probably going to be the sort of toughest nut to crack, um, breaking that aspect of, 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 of the sort of mind of, of the American right. And in, and oddly enough, I think that's going to be something that, um, that the center is going to be the, the most resistant to like you know like how dare you move away from like the slot that you've been that you've been put in which is to be the sort of you know the the enforces for the american state um so and of course one of the forces that's been kind of pushing that sort of narrative has been again explicit intellectual figures on the right as, as we mentioned earlier so the purges of the the buckley rights and i was going to make a joke about you know it's hard to imagine uh, Buckley in a foxhole, but you know, given his perhaps some State Department leanings, you know, he's not completely out of the military-industrial complex with some of his world, real life experiences, perhaps. But it's, it's interesting seeing that dynamic as well uh, be repeated, kind of within modern American history. I know, uh, uh, you know, I remember back in 2016, um, you had uh, Kevin McCarthy joking that he thought uh, Trump in a, a California relatively non-interventionist congressman, Dana Rohrabacher. You know, we're on Putin's payroll, right? Um, again, why, why in the world Trump didn't purge Kevin McCarthy immediately after that? Again, another weakness of Trump right there. Um, now you have people like uh, Dan Crenshaw, you know, I patched John McCain, um, you know, a- actively accusing Marjorie Taylor Greene of, you know, trying to become the next anchor of like Russia today, which is exactly the sort of, of again, you know, if, if you're against, you know, pumping in tens of billions of dollars and in, in untold weaponry into an unstable part of a corrupt Ukrainian regime, then somehow you, you, you are the one that's being anti-American, right? You are the one siding with the enemy here, um, which again, just this, the, the propaganda playbook uh, doesn't change. It just kind of re- repeats throughout uh, the kind of the, the current uh, political framework. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just it's just binary thinking. I mean, and, and unfortunately, I think most people, this is sort of hardwired into us. It takes active effort to to think about crises not merely as the thing that's happening now, but the buildup for you know of you know, decades, you know, or or longer. So I think that's why this 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 Russia this uh, accusation of you know fidelity to Putin. Is so effective because most folks don't know that there was an active debate about uh, you know American expansion to the east in the, in the 90s before Putin even came to power, right? I mean, this has been completely memory hold. Um, so unfortunately, it's it's one of these it's one of these tactics that's effective, especially now in, in the age of social media, which while it gives dissidents a voice, it also gives you know the regime you know a, a means of like mimetic power right they can just keep repeating the the putin russia thing putin russia thing and it's it sticks even if it's completely untrue like you know president trump was not you know particularly acrimonious with russia but that doesn't matter because just you know the this the mere repetition of it unfortunately um has has a lot of power well, George W. Bush wasn't particularly acrimonious with Russia either, but that hardly made him a uh, an agent of Putin. And, uh, and of course, Obama, too. This is, It wasn't until, boy, when was it that uh, Mitt Romney came out and declared Russia America's most important strategic enemy, basically? And it actually earned some chortles at the time because it is obviously untrue. Uh, unless the U.S. just wants to make Russia its most important enemy. I mean, the fact is that Russia is no threat to the United States unless the U.S. somehow manages to back it into a corner and provoke a, a nuclear war. Uh, the, the conventional military is no match for the defensive capability of the U.S. Sure, if the U.S. decides to invade Central or Eastern Europe um, and get involved in the conventional fight with the Russians there, who would be right next to their own supply lines, Sure, that could be a problem for American conventional forces. But can you imagine the scenario under which Russia would be a problem for the United States in the northern North Atlantic uh, off the coast of North America? I mean, it's just not a plausible scenario. Um, But that's what I guess Mitt Romney wants us all to believe, because for whatever reason, he decided Russia was the problem. I mean, at least the people who are anti-China 
they, they have some they make some plausible arguments, right? China's this huge country, the huge economy, a huge uh, footprint in the trade world. Um, and I do disagree that the Uni United States needs to confront China and East Asia and, and that the United States needs to be a global hegemon, including East Asia. But uh, it, at least that has some plausibility to it, whereas this idea that Russia is the, is the biggest threat to the U.S. was just never really convincing at all for anyone who can look at some numbers regarding the military capability of this country uh, versus the U.S. Navy and its its own uh, nuclear defenses and all of that. But somehow that's become the narrative where Russia is just the big thing. And it's been remarkable then to see how it's just come down on party lines. So if you're a John McCain type, a Mitt Romney type, then the Russia is, is the enemy. So if you're a wealthy white GOP establishment politician, Russia is the enemy. If you're just a normal tax paying American from Alabama, uh, you've, you've got other problems that don't include Russia, really. And, but, but those people then get denounced as uh, tools of Putin. So it's a, it's a real bizarre, something I could not have predicted at all 10 years ago, how this weird thing would, would break out and that the, the right would, would somehow divide upon these lines. The thing is, is that the, the anti-Russia, the, the obsessed with Putin thing as a bad guy seems to be just sort of a plaything of the, the elites on the right um, and not really hasn't permeated the populist base at all, whereas the left is now going all in on the national defense state. And there doesn't really seem to be much of an anti-war element left on the left at all beyond, you know, the hardcore leftists that I was friends with in graduate school, right, who we all got along because they were new left types and they liked Rothbard to a certain extent and all of that. But those people are all now 65 years old. So they uh, all that's left now are, are these sorts of people who shout you down on Twitter and they're hardcore uh, anti-Putin crazies. And that just seems to be it now. That's that's your choice. You can be a left winger who's obsessed with Putin or you can be a right wing elite also obsessed with Putin. And it seems the only people uh, opposed to World War Three against the Russians is this populist right. Um and uh, boy, in 2005, I would not have guessed that's how it would shake out. But, but of course, that, that Mitt Romney view of, of foreign policy makes perfect sense if you understand that the responsibility of the American milita military is not the protection of the American homeland, but rather the enforcement of global liberalism abroad, particularly when you're dealing with white countries, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, you know, the, the objection to, to, to Putin, I think, hits differently you know, perhaps there's a little bit of the historical dynamic too, just kind of gold, Cold War nostalgia. But, you know, the, the same sort of arguments are very rarely made with the same sort of passion for Saudi Arabia because, you know, Rush, Russia looks European, Russia looks Western. And so therefore, if you, if you allow for non-liberal global powers to exist, then that is a threat against the entire purpose, right, of the, of the modern American military state. And of course, like that, that that's precisely why Ukraine... Uh, uh, trying you're now looking to uh, uh, legalize gay marriage is a top wartime issue because that is necessary to secure the flank of certain sort of American and European leaders that they are on our side and they are not the others on the cultural issues that are far more important to the current state of you know Western leaders than anything resembling the actual well-being of our own countries. You know, it's 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 fascinating watching this realignment because, in some ways, it it looks a lot like you know nineteen nineteen forty seven, nineteen thirty two, like where the real intellectual force behind intervention now is the center left. It's it's the liberal portion of the Democratic Party. So, in some sense, they've come home, right? Like they're like they're sort of back where they should be. Uh, you know, the Iraq war kind of derailed that for a while. Main, I, I, I mean, let's be honest, mainly because it was a, it was a Republican who, 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 who launched it. They didn't say anything about Syria or Libya or Yemen or the expansion of war in Pakistan. Um, so in some sense, we're sort of resetting the board back to something that, that makes a lot more sense. And going to what Tho is saying, I think part of this is because um, since World War II, the very idea of particularism cannot, cannot be uttered, Right. Because 
fascism, particular Nazism, you know, took particularism in its most, you know, horrible di- direction. We can't even think about nation states as being organic things that that exist in reality that had to have histories. So we're stuck in this cosmopolitan, this sort of hyper cosmopolitanism, right? Where it has to be the entire globe, because if if the entire globe is not part of of one system, there will be war. Uh, and now that the Cold War is, has has ended, the people who are most resistant to the ideology is is the you know is the right, and perhaps not at a at a great, you know, at a really deep intellectual level, but just a instinctual one, right? Um, you know, why is it that I have to sacrifice for liberties on the other side of the planet, especially as we've seen those projects fail, right? Like Afghanistan. I mean, the, the fact that, I mean, there's a reason why that, that's being mem- uh, memory hold so quickly is because the establishment cannot stand you asking questions, very basic questions like, is it possible to import liberal democracy and you know history has shown no right but the thing that we're told is that world war ii particularly with the marshall plan in both europe and japan that modernity can be planned it can be implemented by technocracy and that is a model that can be imported elsewhere in the world and this i mean vietnam was sold this way right we think of it merely as a as an exercise in anti-communism but Really, it was an exercise in liberal internationalism, as was most of the prosecution of the Cold War. So, but now that the Cold War is over, I mean, there's, there, there's, there's, it's harder and harder to keep the right in line on on these questions. They did it for a while with 9/11 and the War on Terror, but now that that sheen's gone, uh, it's difficult to see how they're going to be able to to re to reconstitute the sort of paradigms of the Cold War. Yeah, I guess the, the the key is to just keep casting about until you come up with an axis of evil that's sufficiently evil in the minds of uh, a Midwestern American that they'll subvert all their domestic interests then to the pursuit of this foreign policy goal. And that's what we saw. Uh, you would see those great uh, right wing Midwestern guys like like Howard Buffett, right? saying things like, you know what we're being told to do? We're being told to basically give up all American values for the duration of the Cold War for 20, 25, he he naively said 20, 25 years on this. Uh, And then maybe after it's all over, then we can have American values back. But until then, everything's in the service of, of American foreign policy. And then, of course, Buckley just came out and said straight up, right? Well, if we need to adopt essentially a totalitarian bureaucracy in America, to defeat the communists, well, then that's just what we got to do. And so, so apparently this passed muster with a lot of Americans. They thought, yeah, that seems legit. Let's, uh, we'll just put the U.S. Constitution on hold until we defeat the commies. So you had this amazing blessing of the endless war, essentially, that lasted through the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And Boy, if you were the interventionist right, that was just that was just such a gift from the gods. And I think best case scenario is you get something like that back where there's always a huge foreign enemy. And the Chinese haven't managed. They haven't managed to whip that up even with the Chinese yet, except I mean, you do see that the people who always refer. They never refer to the, the Chinese regime. It's always the CCP. Have you noticed this is like a certain code you use among China obsessed right wingers? Um, we don't, we don't refer to Beijing like you would to any other regime, right? You, you, you refer to Beijing or Berlin or Moscow or whatever. No, no, it's just the CCP, I guess, to emphasize that some sort of like tiny group of communists or something were running that country. But so that's like sort of a weird dog whistle that they use. But even those people seem to be pretty small. Uh, the number of people who are willing to fight a war with China over this issue. I mean, the Taiwan thing doesn't seem to be getting a whole lot of traction. And then, of course, I wonder how long it would take to get uh, to just have a few U.S. battleships blown up with 6,000 sailors on board between before people start to have second thoughts. It could go either way, right? They could double down and say, well, we can't stop fighting this war until it's over. And I don't care how many hundreds of thousands of Americans have to die. But on the other hand, they might say, well, maybe maybe this is a terrible idea. So I actually can't predict which way that would go, but it does seem like they're going to have to put a lot more effort to it because no no new axis of evil seems to be working yet. Well, that, that definitely is the concern. And I, I think there's some naivete that, that you get in, in certain sort of libertarian circles about some of the actions that China 
you know, the, the Chinese regime has taken, right? I, I do think that there's an issue with, uh, you know, I, I think they, they commit explicit sort of economic fraud uh, against American interests. I, I think that, you know, that there, there are, you know, I think, I think China is a more explicitly hostile actor than some of these other uh, countries that have we, we've, we've knocked over in, in kind of recent history in the way that they approach, you know, American Americans kind of kind of broadly in that regard. But on the other side of it, though, is that you know the same sort of miscalculation that kind of helped fuel uh, the Soviet Union, right? Is, is you know, and we're kind of seeing it you know, peak out. I think increasingly as time goes on, right? The, the economic disarray of, of of China right now, you know, that the, the economic hurdles uh, that that Beijing has right now. Um, where you have you know protests going on, you have the the consequences of lockdowns, you have the consequences of of very bad debt within the system. You see them doubling down with credit expansion. You have Xi kind of transitioning away from you know get rich to you know this kind of sustainable lifestyles. You, know, you shouldn't have more than one home, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know the, the the China's weakness is the consequences and the results of their own, own form of, of over the top intervention within you know, the, the domestic economy. However, you know, Washington seems to be doing everything it can to agitate uh, uh, internationally. I mean, you know, not only do you have the, the high profile um, um, political uh, photo ops going on in Taiwan right now, which again, you know, for, for, for decades now, the default position of America, right, is, is that Taiwan belongs to China. Um, you know, we, we've been playing this sort of proxy war with certain countries trying to get them to to ensure that they continue to recognize the Taiwan regime while, you know, while our official position is is, diplom- is, is, is Beijing, et cetera. So the, you know, this has been kind of a, a you know, a, a kind of an interesting sort of dynamic for, for a while now. But now I mean, they're, they're looking at billions of dollars on arms funding, um, you know, trying to be proactive with the same sort of policies that we're now doing in Ukraine post invasion, right? They're, they're trying, they're, they're using the, the excuse of Russia's invasion in Ukraine to be proactive within Taiwan, which of course is going to do nothing but fuel agitation and in its own right, create a, a, a very useful foil for the, you know, for the CCP to rally uh, uh, support amongst Chinese and uh, residents who are, you know, feeling the pain of the economic follies of that same regime, right? Yeah, th- that that does kind of that that, that, that I, I do fear that you're going to end up. We, we were so desperate for a reaction from China, and I'm not sure that China is not kind of with, within the, the state of mind to perhaps give us exactly that sort of, of thing. Which it goes back to you know to you know the, the potential of something like a, a Pearl Harbor, like a 9/11. You know, whether it's she, she, you know, sinking a ship or doing something like that. Um, you know, if you box in a, a country like China far enough, I mean, it's it's just like Russia. I mean, like, you know, there's going to be a time there where their only calculation is going to be going on the offensive. Yeah, you know, going back to the domestic um, side, uh, so I think as you both sort of mentioned, there is a, a bill coming up in Congress now for some, you know, bajillion dollar, you know, arms deal to Taiwan. And it'll be interesting to see how, how those votes break down. Who opposed Ukraine and Taiwan, um, because historically the Republican Party has been the party of the Pacific, and the Democrats by and large have been the party of the Atlantic. Um, that held over even into the early Cold War, right? Some of the, and the non-interventionists that I'm studying were kind of okay with some bilateral security arrangements, including with Taiwan. Um, this goes all the way back to the, you know, 1898 with McKinley and, and the Philippines. So there's a lot of history there. there there's a lot of inertia built up um, with conservatives who are more, you know, suspicious of American relations in Europe, but, you know, much, but more kind to this notion of American benevolent empire in the Pacific. So I think if, if the gains made from the non from the not for the non interventionist right, if they're just to go away, it's going to be because of some sort of escalation in Taiwan. But, you know, even if you can't, get enough voices to stop it i don't under don't undersell the 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 notion of just having a very potent minority uh you know in the early, the early national security state um obviously it you know it's grown it to, to be what it is today but there's an argument to be made that it could have been a hell of a lot worse um on the docket <clears throat> or programs like national service you know you uh Universal military training for all all American citizens. That was a very real possibility coming out of World War II. 
There was this notion that the draft, the military service, was this great liberal project, right? It's, it's almost sort of sold in a kind of New Deal, sort of WPA kind of kind of uh, ideology, right? We're, we're going to make American citizens through military service. And that program was was killed and then, you know, sort of downgraded to a, a selective peacetime draft because there was so much anti-statism still left within the system, within Congress. You know, Truman quite famously tried to nationalize the steel industry. You know, that that got killed. You know, there are some other other aspects of defense spending and, uh, and in the early you know um, Cold War period that that were that were either 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 downgraded or, or killed because there was a, a intransigent minority. So even if the Republican Party cannot you know, become fully this you know this sort of party of non-intervention, so long as there's a twenty-five ish percent you know of people who really believe and are and are committed. And to know how to use power in, in Congress, you know, some good things can come um, from this era in which we live. On that point, um, I know we got to wrap here, wrap up here soon. Um, Tucker Carlson, I think, is a very interesting figure within kind of American politics right now because he has the most watched show on cable news, which makes him, you know, I, I think particularly on the right. Um, you know, particularly after the passing of Rush Limbaugh, I mean, I, I think it's it's very easy to argue that Tucker Carlson is the most influential voice within the American right, and he has been, um, you know, incredibly consistent for many years now on foreign policy, non-interventionism, and questioning the regime's narratives and things like that. Um, one, what what's do you do you think? How, how important do you think is that to help kind of fueling that? Uh, uh, anti-interventionist uh, kind of minority, if, if we can't get anything more than that. And secondly, are there any sort of historical figures that you would identify as sort of parallels to Tucker Carlson and having that very broad, uh, non-interventionist uh, a platform um, that that's that wasn't being overstated, right? You know, as, as the impact of like a, a Father Coughlin or something like that. You know, it, it, are there any other sort of figures that that you would identify as sort of precursors to Tucker? Um, that had a influential impact on maintaining that sort of non-interventionist strain uh, within the right. Yeah, so I mean, I I certainly do think it's important because, like, you you have to give people a narrative, uh, and it's not enough. So I think this is why you know, sort of left-wing critiques of American imperialism fails because, you know, you can't keep you know, poo-pooing the country that everyone lives in, right? You have to give them a sort of counter-narrative. It's not enough to say that American empire merely is the product of just endless search for markets and, you know, this sort of deterministic notion of American power abroad, but someone like a Tucker or someone like people on the non-interventionist right, going all the way back to like Garrett Garrett, if you present empire as a matter of contingency, as a matter of choice, you can give people a counter-narrative to say that America is better than this. Um, you can give them a kind of civic nationalist idea of what America ought to be and how it ought to sort of behave in this world. So having someone like Tucker Carlson, I know he's controversial for some, I mean, whatever, uh, but he is like a foot in the door to ask some of these more substantive questions while still giving people a, kind of a national narrative to sort of glob around. Uh, and as for like historic figures, I'm looking into someone uh, by the name of Dan Smoot. Um, Smoot, I, I sort of described to my colleagues, he's kind of like a more demure version of Alex Jones, but with footnotes. Um, but he had some of the, he asked some of these more substantive questions about America's involvement in the world. He was very critical of U.S.-Israeli relations. You know, he, he was of the opinion that American involvement in the Middle East was what was actually inflaming tensions in the region. He did not think that communism was the sort of prime mover of, of problems there. You know, he felt the same way about, you know, problems in, in Europe, that it was, you know, was the presence of, of American troops, which were inflaming tensions and causing, um, uh, causing um, problems. So in some sense, I think Tucker is kind of like him because he, he has the willingness to, to say that it is the American regime, it is American government, which is the initiator of, of crises, or at least an active participant in them, not merely as like this like passive, you know, reluctant hegemon. It's this notion that American power does have agency in the world, and that agency can bring about, you know, um, poor consequences. Well, Brandon, this has been great. Uh, again, love, love your research. It was great uh, spending time with you at uh, Rothbard Village uh, after RGS sessions. Um, for those out there, if you want to follow Brandon's work, um, you can find him at Twitter at Brandon underscore Buck. Um, anything else you want to pitch, Brandon? 
Uh, I guess this is the time in which I would normally pitch a book, but I know I don't have one yet. So uh, just if you if you want to follow my work, you can follow me on Twitter or uh, uh, um, check out my website, uh, brandonpbuck.com, all one word. Excellent. Well, again, for, uh, for Ryan, for Brandon, this is Stoke Bishop. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.